All right, uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Amanda. I'm one of the ID pharmacists over at the VA. So I figured today, um, since it's August, beginning of a new residency year, fellowship year, it'd be a good time to kind of reinforce some um, topics related to the culture and susceptibility report. Um, so I don't have anything to disclose. And I figured we would start off with this um, cute little comic. So I'll give you all kind of a couple seconds to kind of read through it. So this is one of those points of debate among um, ID doctors, especially are bacteria susceptible or are they sensitive? Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about the nuances of culture and susceptibility today. And hopefully by the end, we'll have an answer to that question. All right, so um, things that I want to go over today is just understanding the antimicrobial susceptibility testing methods and um, highlight some of the updated breakpoints and those interpretations for common organisms um, that have come out within the last year or so. Uh, we'll be able to design an optimal treatment strategy for select cases that may be reported as intermediate or susceptible disc dependent, and we'll go into what those definitions mean. And finally, we can identify some cases where in vitro susceptibility may not always correlate with in vivo success. So essentially, what I like to call when the CNS report is lying to you. So we'll just kind of dive right in. Um, I know this is a block of text, but this is straight from the CLISI manual. Um, and I thought it highlighted a very important point. So because the goal of antimicrobial susceptibility testing is to protect, predict the in vivo success or failure of antibiotic therapy. But all of these tests are performed in vitro and they're under standardized conditions. Um, so that those results can be reproduced. Um, but the takeaway from this is that the results of those antimicrobial susceptibility testing need to be combined with clinical information about the patient and clinical experience to select the most appropriate antibiotic for your patient. So what is an MIC? So that's the minimum inhibitory concentration, which is the lowest concentration of an antimicrobial that inhibits bacterial growth. And there's a couple of common susceptibility testing methods. So we have the BRAS microdilution, um, E-test, and Kirby Bauer discs. So we'll go into each of those so you can kind of understand uh, what goes into them. So the BRAS microdilution is the most common method. And basically, there's a visual on the slide there where you can kind of see just um, two full dilutions of antibiotics that are prepared in test tubes, and then they're all inoculated with the same standardized bacterial solution. And then they're incubated, and then they're inspected to see, okay, did the bacteria grow or not? So the lowest concentration of antibiotic that prevented the growth is represented by the minimum inhibitory concentration, or the MIC. Um, as you can predict, it's very time intensive and labor intensive. Um, so over at the VA, we use the Vitec 2 machine, which kind of auto, uh, automates the whole process uh, and makes it much easier and much quicker to do all of the susceptibility testing. Um, so again, on your screen, you can kind of see a visual. So there are different identification cards. Um, so instead of having all those different test tubes, there's different wells on the card, which are representing the same thing. And there's gram negative cards, gram positive cards, et cetera. And each little well um, has a different uh, twofold dilution of antibiotics. And basically, instead of um, a laboratory technician uh, looking at the vials to see if there's growth, the Vitec 2 machine uh, will do that for you and it will report out the MIC. Um, so we're saving time um, and money. All right. Um, so just the point I want to make is that the minimum inhibitory concentration is not necessarily 
the minimum bactericidal concentration. Um, so if you look at your slides, uh, this is kind of going from, um, from right to left, so not necessarily traditional uh, left to right order. But uh, if you can see the uh, test tube with the MICF4 uh, is the first one that visually does not have any growth in it. So that would be the minimum inhibitory concentration. So the amount of antibiotic that would inhibit the growth. But you, uh, if you go to test tubes to the left and you see the test tube with the concentration of 16, that's actually the first test tube where nothing would grow out on an agar plate. So that's the minimum bactericidal concentration. So just, a, just some things to keep in mind. Everything that's coming back from micro is the minimum inhibitory concentration. So you just want to keep in mind um, other factors that might um, affect your antibiotic therapy um, when you're choosing the best one for the patient. Okay, um, the other two methods are E-test and Kirby Bauer discs, so they're both up here. Um, on the left, you have your E-test. So um, basically what's nice about these is that they have uh, the MIC uh, levels on there, so you can actually have a number uh, reported out. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have Kirby Bauer discs, where they're just measuring mod zone of inhibition. Um, and it's falling within a range of susceptible intermediate or resistance. You're not actually getting the number, which sometimes we need in select cases. All right, um, so the biggest misconception, and I see it all the time on stewardship, and I, I'm sure you do too, is that the MIC range is different for every antibiotic that's tested, and you can't compare them to each other. So I get asked all the time, why don't we just pick the one with the lowest MIC? And the answer is you can't compare them to each other. So a ciprofloxacin MIC of two is not necessarily better than a zosin MIC of eight um, because we're comparing two different things. So I have an example at the bottom. So here we're looking at uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and I have the breakpoints for three different antibiotics. So cipro, sapopine, and zosin. So if you simply picked the one with the lowest MIC, in most cases, it's gonna be a quinolone because they just tend to have a lower range. Um, but if you compared an MIC of four amongst those, four, amongst those three antibiotics, a cipro MIC of four would be very resistant. Um, a sapopim MIC of four would be middle range susceptible, pretty good choice. And um, a zosin MIC of four would be highly susceptible. So you can kind of see the difference just um, in those three antibiotics there. All right, so these are the definitions that are straight out of um, the CLACI manual, and I'm not going to read them to you, but I do want to point out this um, newer category, which is called susceptible dose dependent. And we'll get into that a little bit um, later. But essentially, it's where the susceptibility of an isolate is dependent on the dosing regimen that's used. So we'll have to use very specific dosing regimens to make sure that um, we're getting high enough concentrations to treat that kind of infection. And we'll get into that in a couple of minutes. Um, if you have the Hannah Microbial Guidebook, this is somewhere in there, and it's basically a stoplight, and it's just a nice representation of, okay, if it's green, susceptible, okay, it's probably a good choice. We're just gonna make sure uh, that there's no patient-specific factors that would hinder our therapy. Like we just said, susceptible, dose dependent, we just wanna optimize that dosing regimen to make sure we're achieving appropriate serum concentrations. And then resistant or intermediate, in most cases, we need to choose an alternative agent. All right, so some general rules for interpretation. Um, so we wanna base everything on the clinical scenario, so patient-specific indication and the organism that's growing. So the first thing you wanna look at is, um, in a perfect world, what would be the ideal antibiotic in that situation, okay? If that antibiotic is susceptible, then you have to consider patient-specific factors. 
and whether that choice is appropriate in this patient or not. So do they have drug allergies that would necessitate using a different antibiotic? Is their renal function okay? What about liver function? Are there drug interactions that we can't overcome by increasing or decreasing doses where we would have to use an alternative? And what's the site of action? Is this an empyema where we're not going to get good concentrations? Is this an abscess that needs to be drained before we're going to get adequate um, antibiotic concentrations there? All right. Um, so this is just um, a nice graphic that I put together in terms of um, factors for choosing um, uh, antibiotics for bacteremia. So one of the first things that we want to do is we want to look at an antibiotic that's bactericidal. So if we get rid of everything that's bacteriostatic, okay, we have um, some options still. Then we want something with good serum concentration. So uh, that leaves us with some pure options. What about something that's available as a PO option? So even less. And then we want something with excellent bioavailability. So we're really only left with quinolone. So just looking at those factors can kind of help narrow down uh, your antibiotic choices. Uh, so caveats in general, uh, your in vitro susceptibility does not always equate to in vivo efficacy. And those CLEC definitions of minimum inhibitory concentrations and those interpretations do not comment on any chance of clinical success. So we know that clinical success is dependent upon all those factors that are listed on the uh, slides there. So host response, site of infection, is there toxin production, is there biofilm or an, um, an abscess that's preventing the antibiotics from getting to the site of infection, uh, things like that. So all things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about susceptibility to a drug within a class does not always correspond to susceptibility to all drugs in that class, so commonly with uh, carbapenem. Um, MICs are assessed based on the plasma level, so they may not predict tissue concentration. And like we said, um, these values do not take into account local factors, so uh, pus, necrosis, poor perfusion. You're not going to give antibiotics to someone with an abscess and expect them to do well without first draining it. All right, so here's a nice example. So if you have a culture with MRSA from different sites, where it's going to lead you to kind of uh, pick different antibiotics. So if you have MRSA on the skin, what are some antibiotics that you would choose to treat that? Doxy. Doxy, sure. Uh, Clinda, maybe Bactrim. Uh, moving on to the lungs, you're probably, I mean, maybe you could use some of those, but you might uh, expand your coverage a little bit. So what are some options for MRSA and pneumonia? Vanco. Uh, or even Zyvox, except that to my yeah, Yes, so the adaptomycin is inactivated by the pulmonary surfactant, so it's not good for pulmonary infection. Um, and then blood, uh, we can also use like Banco or Dapto, a nice spectrocidal antibiotic. All right, um, so just to summarize the key points for the minimum inhibitory concentration, uh, here at the VA, they are reported via the Vitec 2 machine. Um, the cards on the panel uh, that are reported uh, have a preset uh, determination of antibiotics. So if something is not on there, you can always call them and ask if it was suppressed, or you can call Micro to add an e-test or Kirby Bauer uh, for something that was not tested. Uh, the biggest point is that MICs are not directly comparable, so you don't just choose the antibiotic with the lowest MIC. Um, and we want to consider our patient-specific factors and drug-specific factors when choosing an antibiotic that is listed as susceptible. All right, so now we're going to jump into some of the updated CLSI breakpoints and interpretations. So um, I wanted to start off 
with this um, point. Uh, basically, uh, it's a nice little comic again um, that's looking at the Enterobacteriale versus the family of Enterobacteriaceae. Um, so for the rest of this presentation, I'm really going to refer to these um, organisms as Enterobacteriaceae, so E. coli, Klebsiella, things like that. But I did want to point out that uh, recently they've been restructured during order of Enterobacteriales, which includes a few different organisms as well that are really not um, applicable to our topic discussion today. Um, the reason I make this point is because at the end of the presentation, I will give you a link to the CLSI manual that has all the breakpoints listed. And if you were to go searching for E. coli or Klebsiella, you wouldn't find it under Enterobacteriaceae because it does no longer exist um, in the Clesi manual there. You have to search under Enterobacteriales. So uh, just more for your information, but for the rest of the presentation, we'll refer to these enteric gram negatives as Enterobacteriaceae. All right. Um, so about a year and a half ago, I would say, the breakpoints for fluoroquinolones for Enterobacteriaceae and Pseudomonas changed, and they changed drastically. So essentially, things that were previously susceptible are now intermediate or resistant. So the breakpoints have decreased. Um, so I've put those uh, new breakpoints up on the slides there. Um, so things to keep in mind is that our lab has not updated to these new breakpoints yet. So when you're looking in CPRS, they still have the old interpretations there. So it's really important to look at the MIC value uh, to be able to determine if it's susceptible, intermediate, or resistant, because they're still the lab is still using those previous breakpoints, which are much higher. Um, so on the screen, you have the updated quinolone breakpoints first. Um, Cipro and Levo for Enterobacteriaceae, so E. coli, Klebsiella, things like that. Um, the breakpoints for Pseudomonas also changed. They also decreased. So those breakpoints are up on the slide for you. I just want to point out that the dosing regimens that were used to determine these breakpoints are anti-pseudomonal doses. So if you are using these for acetamol infection, just kind of make sure you're using those higher doses. So for Leviquin, it's 750 milligrams, um, IV or PO once daily, assuming normal renal function. Cipro is 750 PO VID or 400 milligrams IV Q8 hours. Um, so just make sure you're using those higher doses if you are um, using these for pseudomonas infection because I think a lot of times we tend to um, just go with normal dosing, and we can't do that because the breakpoints were determined based on these higher dosing regimens. Uh, the other big change was with Enterococcus species, so both Enterococcus fecalis and Enterococcus spatium, um, in terms of daptomycin. So up at the top, um, Enterococcus fecalis, less than or equal to two, uh, it's susceptible based on a dosing regimen of six mg per keg. Uh, previously, that was uh, less than or equal to four. And again, the lab uh, is not uh, updated with these new breakpoints yet. So you really have to look at that MIC value to determine the interpretation of susceptible, intermediate, or not. Uh, on the bottom, we have Enterococcus spatium. So you'll notice this is one of those organisms that has a susceptible dose-dependent category. Um, so the dosing regimen uh, tends to be higher. So you'll see here the uh, interpretation of less than or equal to 4 was based on a dosing regimen of 8 to 12 mg per kg. Um, so these are relatively high doses of daptomycin. So ideally, we do want um, that MIC value to determine if we can kind of back off on our therapy a little bit, or do we need a higher dose um, for adequate treatment? 
And the last one I put on here was for staph aureus and septiraline. Um, so here at the VA, we don't normally test for septiraline susceptibilities. Um, I don't know if it's different at the other hospitals, but I did want to put it on here. So again, uh, less than or equal to one is susceptible. And that was based off a dosing regimen of you know, normal 600 milligrams K-12 hours. Uh, it also has a susceptible dose-dependent category with an MIC of two to four, and that was determined based off um, a Q8 hour regimen. So if you don't have susceptibilities and you're treating an invasive infection, it might be prudent to start with a Q8 hour dosing regimen until you have the MIC value to know that you can come down to a Q12 regimen. Um, but again, you would have to request that separately here at the VA. Okay, um, now we're gonna jump into uh, utilizing alternative dosing for select cases. So we're gonna talk about enterobacteriaceae, so enteric gram negative rod, um, in terms of susceptible dose dependent category um, for safepine. And then we're gonna talk about Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the breakpoints and interpretations of susceptible or intermediate to zofem. And I think most of you will be pretty familiar um, with the evidence kind of backing these recommendations. All right, so why do we do alternative dosing? So the optimization of dosing is based on a lot of different things, uh, patient characteristics, the causative organism, site of infection, but also on the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic characteristics of the drug. So this is an important part of stewardship. We wanna you know, maximize the efficacy of our antibiotics, um, prevent the emergence of resistance, and you know, just be overall good stewards of our current antibiotic armamentarium, because we know there's not too many new ones in the pipeline. So why do we use alternative dosing? Um, you probably know beta-lactams exhibit time-dependent bactericidal activity, which means that the bactericidal activity is dependent upon the time the drug spends above the MIC. So on the bottom left of your slide, you can see basically just the basic concentration versus time uh, graph. Um, so basically that dashed line in the middle, I don't know if you can see my cursor right here, is the minimum inhibitory concentration. So all the time that you're spending above that line is a marker of efficacy for our beta-lactam antibiotic. Um, so that is expressed as the percent of free time spent above the MIC, and it varies for the different agents within the beta-lactam class. So for our cephalosporins, we wanna be spending at least 60 to 70% of our time above the MIC. Uh, for penicillins, it's about 50%, and I believe for carbapenems, it's about 40 to 50% of the time. Okay, so there's a couple different types of alternative dosing. So we can maximize the time above the MIC by a variety of different methods. So you can just increase the dose and maintain the dosing interval. So that's the first uh, uh, visual that you see on your screen. So just kind of increasing the dose. Uh, in the middle, we have what we do with cefepine. So you keep the dose the same, but you shorten the dosing interval so the frequency of dosing increases. So the example that's here, um, you go from one gram Q12 hours to one gram Q6 hours. And then finally, uh, the last visual is you maintain the dose, but you prolong the infusion time. So this is something that we see with um, dosin. So instead of infusing it over 30 minutes, the infusion is over four hours. And you can kind of see in the graphics there uh, with all of these strategies, you're spending more time above the organism's MIC. All right, um, so we transitioned to sapopeam alternative dosing probably about five or six years ago. Um, 
Um, so this is just a representation of the algorithm for cefepime dosing at our institution. So based on indication and then based on real function, you kind of just go across and choose what would be appropriate. So we'll kind of go into the evidence behind this in just a second. Uh, you will point out here under normal renal function, none of these regimens are one gram Q8, which tends to be a go-to regimen. And we'll talk about that as well. All right, um, so I picked this study because it has a really nice graphic, but there are a few others if you are interested um, after the lecture. So this is a PKPD a study that looked at ICU patients with normal renal function. Um, and basically, they developed this Monte Carlo simulation for um, different type of PM dosing regimens. And they looked at the probability of target attainment. So we were just talking about the time above the MIC for cephalosporins. We wanted that to be 60 to 70% of the time. So they identified a target attainment of 65% of the time spent above the MIC uh, for different gram-negative organisms. So basically, uh, this is just a nice visual representation of what they found. So on the right-hand side, you have your different dosing regimens. So two grams Q8 is that filled in triangle. A gram Q6 is the filled in circle, which is considered an alternative dosing regimen. Uh, two grams Q12 is the open circle, and then one gram Q12 is the filled in square. So you can see uh, once you get to an NMIC of eight, that's kind of where you start to see a lot of discrepancies between these dosing regimens. And the only one that hits that probability of target attainment at a higher MIC is the two grams Q8. Um, this is the same data, just displayed a different way. So again, you can see the different dosing regimens and the different gram-negative rods, and then the probability of target attainment with each of these. So I do want to highlight that the alternative dosing regimen of one gram Q6 hours um, consistently achieved better um, probability of target attainment than the two grams Q12 hours, which is basically considered the standard dosing regimen. Um, so you're using the same amount of antibiotics per day, same cost. Um, you're just giving it a little bit more frequently and you're achieving um, more time spent above the MIC. Uh, what this study also noted is that the higher dosing regimen, two grams IVQ8, we mentioned that was necessary for higher MICs, especially eight and above. Um, but they also noted that uh, the highest probability of target attainment for certain organisms, so Pseudomonas and Acinobacter, was with this higher dosing regimen. So uh, just pointing out again that one gram Q6 versus two Q12, higher probability of target attainment pretty much across the board um, using the same amount of drug, just a different dosing strategy. So the benefits of using this alternative cefepime dosing, obviously we're optimizing our time above the MIC by using the same or sometimes less total daily drugs. Um, and in some cases we can see some cost savings associated with that. We're really standardizing the off-label dosing of cefepime one gram Q8 hours. Um, and we're getting better empiric coverage of organisms with elevated cefepime MICs. So, you know, we're starting antibiotics empirically before we have cultures back. If we're starting with the gram Q6, uh, automatically we're covering for organisms with a higher MIC. And then when we have the MIC results come back, we can always de-escalate our therapy or back off on our dose. Okay, um, so we'll talk a little bit about the susceptible dose-dependent category for anterior bacteriaceae. 
Um, so this is an example of a culture and susceptibility report here. Um, and I just want to show you how it is reported. So on the panel itself, it will be reported as intermediate because they can't go ahead and change that interpretation. There's no way to put an SDD under the interpretation. But if you go up to the top, right under the organism identification, they'll tell you that cephapheme intermediate equals susceptible disc dependent in this situation. So just make sure you're looking carefully at your culture and susceptibility report um, because the interpretation uh, may be a little bit different than what my grant was telling you. So these breakpoints were changed quite a few years ago now. Um, back in 2014, uh, you can see the previous breakpoints up there. And again, just like the quinolones uh, were changed last year, these breakpoints came down uh, a lot. So the previous susceptible breakpoint of less than or equal to eight was based on a higher dose that was that um, then was used in treatment. So when you're using lower doses, with those elevated MICs, we would see clinical failure. So that was one of the reasons that they really uh, changed those breakpoints. And also, we want to optimize the use of drugs for multi-drug resistant gram-negative rods. So if we can optimize the dosing of cefepine instead of going to something a little bit broader spectrum, obviously that's good antimicrobial stewardship. So again, this is straight from the CLSI manual. I'm not going to read it to you, but it's basically just telling you um, what does susceptible dose dependent mean. And basically it means uh, with certain MICs, you need to use higher doses, more frequent doses, or both to achieve um, high drug exposure to actually combat um, that organism. So why do we say susceptible dose dependent and not just intermediate? Um, one of the reasons is intermediate is considered to be poorly understood by some clinicians and generally just disregarded as, oh, that's resistant, like let's just take a different antibiotic. So the susceptible dose dependent category provides specific doses and conveys th this message. So um, higher doses may be effective if the MIC is in that susceptible dose dependent range, or you can back off and use a lower dose um, if the MIC is in the susceptible range. And like we said, um, susceptible dose dependent dosing is consistent with um, antibiotic stewardship goals. So just kind of emphasizing the appropriate dosing based on patient specific factors. So these are the Cefepime MIC breakpoints for the family of Enterobacteriaceae, so E. coli, Clansiella, things like that. And what dosing regimen was used to develop that breakpoint. So you'll see the susceptible range is less than or equal to two, and that was based on a dose of one gram Q12 hours. Our susceptible dose dependent category four to eight, um, and the MIC of four was developed on a dosing regimen of about two grams to 12 hours, whereas the MIC of eight was based off two grams to eight hours, so a much higher dose. And then obviously um, 16 or above is resistant, we can't use this antibiotic. So um, the take home points are if you have uh, Enterobacteriaceae with a cefepime MIC of four, you want to at least be using a gram Q6 or two grams Q12. And then if that MIC is eight, you want to use high dose cefepime, so two grams Q8 hours. So just to kind of summarize our key points for cefepime, um, the empiric use of alternative dosing, so one gram Q6 hours instead of 2Q12 uh, does two things. It helps standardize our cefepime dosing across the hospital, and it accounts for organisms with a higher MIC uh, empirically until we have that culture and susceptibility data available. <laughs>
Um, along those lines, you want to always check the MSC and staff team once those results are available. And if it is one, then you can always kind of back off on your dosing regimen a little bit. Um, we will kind of skip over the questions. They were just kind of reinforcing the concepts of um, when do you use higher dose type of team? When do you kind of de-escalate when you know those MACs are lower? Um, next, we're going to talk quickly about uh, Zosin extended infusion. So we're talking about Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates. So the CLSI breakpoints, again, are different than what the lab reports. So susceptible is less than or equal to 16, intermediate 32 to 64, uh, but the culture and susceptibility report will still use the old interpretation. So it's really important to be looking at that MAC number instead of the interpretation. Um, like most hospitals, I think at this point, we do use an extended infusion protocol. So we're using um, Q eight hour dosing infused over four hours instead of Q6 over 30 minutes. Um, and that's basically um, derived from this pivotal study that looked at uh, dosing for pseudomonas infections. And basically, it's a nice little graphic, um, but I won't spend too much time on it because we wasted a little bit of time with our technical difficulties. Um, this was another article that looked at a hospital-wide substitution of uh, regular infusion versus extended infusion. And their primary endpoint was mortality and length of stay. And they saw a statistically significant decrease in um, both of those. So when you look at the um, modeling of these, we're looking at susceptible isolates, so an MAC of less than 16. So the shaded circles over here are 30-minute uh, infusions of 3.375 grams, and the shaded squares over here are 4.5 grams Q8 extended infusion. So you really don't see a discrepancy until you got to those higher MICs um, because they're all up here above that 90% probability at target attainment. But once you hit the MIC of 16, then we really need to use 4.5 grams Q8 hours extended infusion. For intermediate isolates, again, not going to spend too much time. Um, but you really don't have too many options. And then once you hit an MIC of 64, um, you really can't use this one anymore. So just be aware uh, that MIC breakpoints are different than those reported by the lab. Susceptible, less than or equal to 16, intermediate, 32 to 64. And then I put a nice little interpretation of, you know, what that MIC value is and then what's the recommended regimen. So if it's eight or less, you can probably go ahead and use standard infusion. If it's 16, like we saw, you absolutely have to use extended infusion. If it's 32, I probably wouldn't use it unless it's like a UTI or something very easily to treat, um, but you would want to use higher doses. And then again, 64, you use an alternative regimen. So again, I had a couple of case questions kind of reinforcing this concept, but we'll kind of skip over them um, in favor of some uh, other examples. So, we're going to talk about um, when in vitro susceptibility may not correspond to in vivo susceptibility. So we'll talk about inducible resistance, hetero resistance, and a couple of other examples. So the first one is inducible resistance. So we'll start with a case. Uh, this is a male veteran with sacral osteo. His bone cultures are growing enterobacter orogenies with the susceptibility listed there. Um, so which of the following antibiotics is the least optimal treatment uh, given an anticipated duration of six weeks? So what do you guys think? Yeah, so let's talk about why. So AMC beta-lactamases, um, 
So AMPC beta lactamases are cephalosporinases, which mediate resistance to most penicillins, early generation cephalosporins, so one, two, third generations, and some beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitors. Um, there's two types, so they can be encoded on the chromosomes or they can be plasma mediated. And unfortunately, AMPC enzymes can be inducible and can be expressed at high levels by mutation. So this is a nice little graphic for those of you who are visual learners. So this is a gram-negative cell wall. So we have our beta-lactam. So typically, that would be something like cefoxetin, maybe even imipenem. So they enter the outer membrane through the porins. And then once they're in there, this periplasmic space here, they can interact with the penicillin binding proteins. And once they reach that site of action, you get an increase in um, these cell wall fragments. And basically, you get a buildup of cell wall fragments. And AMPD inside here cannot process all of these. So you get a conformational change in AMP R, which increases the production of AMP C, which then pushes that all out into the periplasmic space which then binds to um, the beta-lactams that are there. Um, so in, in a sense, you're getting inducible resistance. Um, so there are common organisms that pause, uh, that um, are associated with AMPC. So in the interest of time, I'll just kind of tell you, um, but it is important for you guys to um, recognize these organisms. So serratia, Providentia, Asneobacter, and indole positive protease. So, protease uh, mirabilis is indole negative most of the time. So, we're talking about Vulgaris pinarii here. Uh, Citrobacter, and then the big one is Enterobacter. So, for bonus points, does anyone know um, the updated nomenclature that affects this acronym? So Enter go ahead. It, yeah. So name? what's the new name? <laughs> no, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um Clebsiella orogenes instead of Enterobacter orogenes. So just something to keep in mind because they keep switching up the names on us. Um so basically what does this mean? If you have any of these organisms, generation cephalosporin. Um, there's potential to increase AMPC production that can lead to treatment failure, and that can happen as soon as three to four days on therapy. Um, because we don't have cefoxetin on our culture and susceptibility report, sometimes we'll use um, cefazolin as a surrogate marker. So cefazolin, a first generation cephalosporin is resistant, but your third generations are susceptible. That should give you a clue that this could produce AMPC. So what about cisterylene and AMPC? So we typically think of cisterylene as a combination um, of vancomycin and ceftriaxone in terms of spectrum, but it's also considered a fifth generation cephalosporin. So where does it fall in the full AMPC spectrum? And basically what we know is that it's an oxyamino cephalosporin, but it is a weak inducer of AMPC beta lactamases um, similarly to that of cefoxetin or ceftriaxone. And there have been case reports of resistance that has developed on ceftriaxone therapy. So just keep in mind, if you have a potential AMC producer, uh, ceftriaxone may not be the best therapy uh, for long-term use. So here we have another case. Um, we have a 43-year-old male veteran with a small abscess and surrounding cellulitis. It was drained and it's growing sap aureus with the susceptibilities below. Uh, the team wants to discharge him on PO antibiotics, which of the following would be a poor choice. So, so erythromycin resistance, 
So without knowing, Clindo would probably be the uh, not optimal choice in this case. So when we talk about resistance and staph aureus, uh, macrolized England cosamide antibiotics, so erythromycin and clindamycin, are chemically distinct, but they do share a similar mechanism of action. Um, and they can also share an acquisition of resistance. So um, how is clindamycin resistance and staph aureus kind of classified? So it can be methyl methylation via ERM genes. Um, and we'll see that because there's overlapping binding sites um, between erythromycin and clindamycin. Um, so there's two different ones that can be constitutive where it's always produced where it will appear as clindamycin resistant or inducible where it may appear as clindamycin susceptible um, because it's only produced in the presence of an inducing agent, which has a very specific name, which is called the D-test. So for staph aureus, um, if you put an erythromycin Kirby Bauer disc and a clindamycin disc next to each other on a plate, if it's erythromycin resistant, um, and you see kind of a D for the D test um, on the clindamycin, that means there's inducible clindamycin resistance. So again, on a susceptibility report, this is how it will look. You, if it's resistant to erythromycin, susceptible to clinta, you should ask micro for a D test, and then they will write their comments up here at the top and say yes or no. So for take-home points there, um, our space and spice bugs uh, may harbor gene setting code for ANSI beta lactamases. So our third generation cephalosporins are usually a poor choice for therapy. Um, and use caution with cefepime or some beta lactam beta lactamase inhibitors for long courses. And then staph aureus um, isolates that are reported as erythromycin resistant but susceptible to clinda may inhibit inducible resistance to clinda. So you want to confirm with a D-test um, to avoid any risk of therapy failures. So um, I'll go kind of quickly through the rest because I know we're a little short on time. Um, the next topic is heteroresistance. Um, so we'll skip over the case, but basically um, heteroresistance hetero is this idea that subpopulations of bacteria exhibit a wide range of susceptibility to a particular antibiotic. Um, so essentially you can have something that looks susceptible, but if you have a sub, um, subpopulation that is intermediate or resistant, then that can kind of go out of control and cause therapy failure. So this is an extrapolation from the CDC image of like, why do you need to take your full course of antibiotics? But the concept is the same. So if you have on the left an orange subpopulation that's resistant and you give an antibiotic that's susceptible um, to all the other ones, what's gonna happen is you're just gonna be left with the one resistant subclone and then you have no pressure left. So it's just going to kind of reproduce and all of a sudden you now you have an infection with a more resistant organism. So, um, so this is commonly seen with a couple of different bugs. So coag negative staph, and Asmiobacter um, most commonly. So for coag negative staph, 80% um, of these uh, isolates are going to be acetylene or methicillin resistant. So even if it's reported as susceptible on the panel, if you're treating an invasive or serious infection, you do wanna go ahead and use uh, something for MRSA coverage um, in the event that there were there was resistance in that sample. Along the lines of Asmidobacter, um, what I wanted to point out here is that um, imipenem and meropenem resistance are discordant, and the susceptibility report will only point out one. So typically, imipenem is on our panel. And um, if you do want to use meropenem, it's a good idea to go ahead and request an e test just to make sure that it is resistant because, or it is susceptible because susceptibility to imipenem does not necessarily mean susceptibility to meropenem. Um, all right, so we have like two minutes left. So I just wanted to go very quickly through these. Um, other examples for enterococcal infections, 
really um, ampicillin plus or minus gent is the drug of choice. I see a lot of times people want to use fluoroquinolones because they have a nice low MIC, which we already talked about, but enterococci can develop fluoroquinolone resistance very quickly. So we really recommend against it. Some of the panels will show ESCL positive infections that are susceptible to cefepime, um, but we really don't recommend using cefepime in these cases um, for a number of reasons. Obviously, the efficacy is variable, and those MICs may increase in the presence of a higher bacterial inoculum. And then finally, um, proteus species, a lot of times we see imipenem resistance. Um, so based on our most recent antibiogram, only 13% of proteus isolates were susceptible to imipenem. And the reason behind that is not the production of carbapenemases, it's just innately a little bit higher uh, than that for meropenem. So it doesn't mean it's a CRE, you can use you know, whatever else that it's susceptible to. All right, so in conclusion, if ID wasn't difficult enough, sometimes the CNS report is misleading. Use your clinical judgment, uh, look at patient-specific factors. And I don't know if Dr. Tony is on the line, but he is a very strong proponent of Dr. Tony is sensitive, but bacteria are susceptible. Um, uh, this is just a nice uh, graphic for you. These are the updated MIC values, and the link at the top is actually the link to the CLSI uh, PDF book. So you can look up um, any breakpoints that you need to. So I think that's 12 o'clock. So if you guys have any questions, please let me know.